Please support this channel by clicking on the links below. The Medjunetta, Volume 1, by Raun Amen Nefer. Chapter 7, The Cosmological View of Man, or The Spiritual Anatomy of Man. Everything stated thus far regarding cosmology is of no value unless it can be translated into a means of giving man an understanding of self and serve as a guide to correct living. Self-knowledge, it will be seen, is the beginning and end of all knowledge. Who and what is man can only be understood by reference to the purpose of the creation of the world. Earlier we learned that the essential state of the supreme being is one in which its energy matter is not differentiated into things. Hence, God lacks experience in its essential state. God modifies its existence into the world as the means through which to have experience. Although there is an infinitude of creatures making up the world, only one of them was created for the express purpose of of serving as the vehicle through which God can transfer its consciousness into and realize the fullness of its being. This creature is man. The knowledge of this spiritual fact has been expressed in many of the scriptures of the world. In the Commission, ancient Egyptian scripture, the book of Knowing the Manifestations of Ra, about 2800 B.C., we come across the following statements regarding Asar, who is the symbol of the man or woman who has completed his or her spiritual growth, enabling God to manifest itself in the world through him or her. I produced myself from primeval matter. My name is Asar's. From the primeval matter of primeval matter, I have succeeded in all that I have willed on earth. I was alone, not born were they, not had I spit in the form of shoe, not had I emitted tefnut, I brought through my mouth my own name, that is to say, a word of power, and I, even I, came into being in the forms of the infinite power of being. The same awareness is expressed in Genesis 1 verse 26 which states that God makes man in their own likeness, or, as was earlier stated in this book, the supreme being and man, through its creative organs, creates physical realities. While the above makes a great deal of sense from a spiritual, philosophical standpoint, it flies in the face of man's common experience. If man is made in the likeness of God, then why is this fact not evident in our daily experience? The answer is a simple one. Mankind as a whole has not completed its evolution. In the same way that a three-year-old has the faculties of an adult in a latent state, so do the majority of people today have their divine faculties in a dormant state. The various stages and goal of our evolution are shown by the tree of life. We are born with spheres 10, our physical body with its animating spirit, and 9, the personality division of our spirit and learning faculty in an awakened state and we develop from the bottom up. All of the other faculties represented by spheres 8 to 1 are in a dormant state. In the same way that the development of our physical faculties is cued to our chronological age, so is the development of our spiritual faculties. The first 28 years of our life is spent awakening and developing the 8th and 7th spheres. These are our syllogistic, logical, and inventive artistic faculties respectively. The 8th and 7th, which as we saw in previous chapters, correspond to the celestial workers and are therefore the faculties that we utilize primarily in making a living. Spirit 8 equals technologies, commerce, etc. Sphere 7 equals scientific and artistic invention. If the social order is enlightened, the following 21 years are devoted to the awakening of our moral and mental abstractive faculties. It will seem strange to most people to hear that the moral faculties in man are not developed until after the 28th year of life. Yet, 
This is supported by conventional wisdom. What do you think will happen if the police and the armed forces in America or most nations were to be disbanded? The answer can be inferred from previous riot situations in which many otherwise law-abiding persons have been seen, always to their dismay, in the act of stealing and vandalism. Unfortunately, most societies lack the knowledge of how to spiritually cultivate their citizens so that the majority fails to develop the moral part of their spirit, spheres 6, 5, and 4. We will later see that there are a great number of behavioral expressions of an immoral nature that the majority of people in the world is incapable of recognizing as such. Take, for instance, the act of smoking tobacco in public, which forces others to inhale gases that are well-known poisons. Before the discovery of DDT, tobacco was one of the major insecticides. While you would not be permitted to even slap strangers, you are permitted to poison them in socially acceptable ways. This is one of the innumerable examples of the inability of the majority of people to think on an abstract level, spheres 4, 5, and 6. They only recognize as immoral those specific examples of immorality that have been pointed out to them. On their own, they cannot see that forcing others, children even, to inhale tobacco smoke is even more immoral than, let's say, slapping a stranger. If an individual is able to develop these moral faculties, spheres 4, 5, and 6, he becomes a candidate to develop the divine faculties. When an individual develops the faculty of the third sphere, he or she has the ability to influence events in the environment through the use of words of power, i.e., the person shares in the omnipotence of the supreme being, although not in the same magnitude. The second sphere faculty enables the person to intuitively understand all of life's situations. This is wisdom or omniscience. The development of the first sphere enables man to experience the fact that his person and that of all others are parts of one being. For example, although a person's physical body is made up of billions of cells, individual creatures, it is experienced as one creature. This experience of oneness is beyond the intellectual understanding of oneness that most people hold in common. Before we can embark on a full explanation of the differences between the various stages of man's development, we must have a full understanding of the faculties making up his spirit. The tree of life as a guide to man's spirit or mind. We have seen that mankind, certainly 99% of the people, has not completed its evolution. We cannot therefore understand man by merely studying the behavior of man through the ages. It is like arriving at conclusions about adults through the study of children. In the same way that we know that there are potentials residing in children waiting to be awakened at the same time appointed by the biological growth process. By studying adults, we know that there are potentials in mankind and what they are by the study of people who have evolved beyond the present level of human evolution. We also know of others, although not more evolved, who have revealed faculties not yet awakened in the majority of people. To understand men, we must therefore begin by analyzing the faculties and behaviors of those people who have completed their evolution. We will see that all of man's faculties can be cataloged in one of the spheres of the tree of life. Sphere zero. Faculty of man's spirit. It has already been said that man's true essential and original being is composed of an energy matter that is devoid of limitations. Hence, the cipher zero symbolizes the absence of conditionings and limitations characterizing the essential state of energy matter, which can neither be created nor destroyed, as we know well from Western science. Sphere one. The first sphere corresponds to man's self-identity, as we are speaking of the perfected, fully evolved man. Her identity is with zero with the fact that the root and essence of her being is unconditioned and unlimited in its creative capacity. 
In other words, there is no identification with any personality complex that is characterized by specific human preferences, likes, dislikes, inclinations, abilities, or inabilities, etc. At this level, the self-identity rises beyond sexual class, race, occupation, nationality, etc. There are no conditioned reflex patterns in the spirit that can force the individual to respond in a determined manner. In everyday life, this means that the person will not be controlled by conditioned responses. He will be totally free of the control by likes, dislikes, love, hatred, fear, anger, and the whole host of emotions and desires. As each personality type is a pattern of conditioned ways of thinking and emotional responses to given situations, the individual who has attained to the realization of her essential nature Zero and Sphere One is able to change personalities as changing situations demand. Here the self identifies with the unstructured state of subjective energy matter composing the spirit at the first sphere level, the Ba. In the comedic tradition, an individual who has attained to this level of development is called an Osar. The ability to manifest any personality is of utmost importance. An individual succeeds when the demands and challenges of life are to be met by his natal personality traits. A fiery person will carry the moment if a situation demands courage, zeal, rashness, etc. But life's challenges will not always come to the fiery person through a fiery window. What would such a person do when challenges demand patience, calmness, following, etc. If the person identifies not with his natal fiery personality, but with the evolved higher Osirian nature, then he will be able to assume the personality type that can best meet the situation of the moment. In other words, the individual will go through life without any limitations imposed on his self-image. This is the state of the great liberation sought by all sojourners on the spiritual path. It is obvious that what most people in the world identify as their self is not the first sphere of the tree of life. The second sphere of the tree of life corresponds to the will of God and of the evolved man. In chapter 6, we learn that all of creation is the differentiation of one and the same eternal and infinite energy matter. Even man's being is an individualization of the being of God. It follows then that as all things are integral parts of one being encompassing the world, everything that a person wills to achieve must be in harmony with the will of the whole. The ability to intuit the will of God is, according to spiritual tradition, wisdom. We will have a great deal more to say about this. What is important here is to understand that with the fully evolved individual, what is willed is not based on personal needs or wants. The person will intuit from God the what, when, how, and why of events that are to take place in people's lives. It is the only way in which all human actions can be in harmony with each other, leading thus to peace and prosperity. The other implication of the unlimited potential of the energy matter that is the source of all things is the fact that as there is no limit to what it can bring forth, there is no limit to what man can will. One of the greatest causes of human failure is the imposition of limitations on what we can achieve in the world. The third sphere of the tree of life corresponds to the spiritual power of God and of the evolved man. This is the vehicle that carries out all that is willed at the second sphere. We must recall the fact that the will is nothing more than what the word denotes in everyday speech. When a person says, I will to do so and so, she is expressing a possibility. Its realization depends on the means or the power to carry the potential into actuality. We will later see how the common error of taking the will for a faculty of power is a major cause of people's failures in life. The actualizer of what is possible is the third sphere of the tree. Residing in this sphere are 50 creative forces that are in charge of all manifestations in the world. 
Each one of these forces has its own specific vibratory wave and rate and can be evoked, literally called out into creative activity by chanting in a state of trance. They are the matricas, matrices, or little mothers of the Kundalini Tantric Yoga tradition of Indish Kush, the 50 oarsmen who propel the boat of Asur, the 50 gates of life and death of Bina, the third sphere of the tree, the 50 Bini Elohim, sons of God, which reside in the third sphere, the 50 skulls making up the necklace of the great black mother or Kundala of the Indus Kush, and most revealing, it corresponds to the 50 single sound units making up the Kundalini, Light Force, Ra, Body and God and Man. They are the basis of all mantras or Hikau, words of power. We shall see later that they are the divine forces that Western historians and theologians have translated as the gods of the various religions of black people. Author Avalon in The Serpent Power states, Each man is Shiva, a deity, also, and can attain his power to the degree of his ability to consciously realize himself as such. For various purposes, the Devata, deities, are invoked. Mantra, a word of power, and Devata are one and the same. By practice, with the mantra, the presence of the Devata is invoked. Japa or repetition of the mantra is compared to the action of a man shaking a sleeper to waking him up. The biblical claim that man is made in the likeness of God is substantiated by the fact that these 50 powers, which are the sources of all events and things in the world, are shared by both God and man. The latter, of course, expresses these powers to a much lesser degree. As I said earlier, God and man, like the ocean and a drop of water, have the same creative qualities but differ quantitatively in the expression of those qualities. It must be kept in mind, however, that for the majority of people in the world, this faculty with its vast powers is dormant. Its awakening is the subject of Kundalini Yoga, the 12 hours of the night initiation ritual of the Ra theology of commit, etc., the fourth sphere of the tree of life corresponds to the seat of man's intuitive sense of law and order. To fully understand man's behavior, we must abandon the belief that law and order in the human world is dependent on the framing and enforcement of rules by men. It takes little to see that there are natural forces regulating all natural events in the world, as well as in man's biological makeup. These forces have their seat in the fourth sphere. In the fourth division of the spirit of God and man, the Ab of the tree of life. When an individual evolves to this level, its ordering influence is extended to the mental operations of the individual. The result is an instinctive emotional order, moral behavior, and intuitive cosmologically ordered thinking. Cosmological thinking, which is beyond and superior to syllogistic logic, is based on the ability to intuitively perceive the abstract general class to which the specific issues of life belong. Let's illustrate this principle. As the majority of people in the world have not yet evolved this faculty, they are unable to intuit, learn from within, all of the specific manifestations of the general class morality. All of their moral actions are extuited, learned from the outside or from others. Such a person, for example, may believe himself to be moral because he would not steal, beat up on others, or even pour a non-lethal dose of arsenic into someone's drink. Yet he fails to see the immorality of poisoning the body of those he smokes around making others pay for his medical bills, Medicaid and Medicare, for illnesses induced by such purposeless and irresponsible acts as smoking or self-poisoning by eating artificially colored, preserved, and flavored foods, etc. Able to think only on a concrete level, such people can only identify specific instances of immorality, that have been pointed out to them by their instructors and society. It is easy to see 
how the majority of the problems of the world arise. A government claims that the citizens don't have the right over their bodies when it comes to taking unproven medicines for deadly illnesses. Yet, it gives the citizens the right to poison themselves with tobacco, devastate themselves and each other through alcohol and so forth. There is a very far-reaching and subtle principle at work here. The ability to perceive abstractions enables an individual to connect and to unify events and things that may differ widely in form and external appearance. It enables the person, as shown above, to see that the introduction of non-fatal amounts of tobacco into another's body is no different from lacing someone's food with non-fatal doses of arsenic. In both cases, the deadly cumulative effect is the same. As this faculty enables us to see through the differences between people, it is the intuitive intellectual basis of love. This faculty in man's spirit is symbolized in the comedic tradition by the goddess of law and order, Mat. As the foundation of love, which is the source of wealth, it is the goddess Lakshmi, or Sri Deva of Indus Kush. Wealth, according to spiritual tradition, results from the pooling of human resources in a harmonious, peaceful, and cooperative manner. That this faculty is not developed in the majority of people in the world should be clear from the above examples. If anyone takes exception to the statement that the majority of the people cannot yet intuit moral principles, let him ponder on what would happen if the police in any major Western nation were to be abolished. Would anyone be surprised to find that many people hitherto thought of as moral would be engaged in criminal activities? Have we not seen this exact type of event take place every time there was a riot, natural disaster, etc.? The mental application that ties externally unrelated species through an abstraction is called synthesis. It must be noted that the popular use of the term synthesis is incorrect. There is a common misunderstanding of the mental application that the term denotes. The fifth sphere of the tree of life is the seat of man's analytical faculty. As with synthesis, the popular conception of the meaning of the term analysis is mistaken. In an earlier chapter, it was observed that the term was literally composed of analog plus lysis, i.e. to separate lysis through analogs, which are abstractions. It is the opposite of synthesis. Analysis separates through abstractions. Things which, on a concrete level, may be members of the same species, or two, establishes abstract differences between even more abstract categories. We must recall the example given in which the fifth sphere separates the abstract category, ferocious predators, into the lower abstract categories, feline, canine, etc., we shall have occasion to see how the definitions of synthesis and analysis that are given in this book are the only means of distinguishing such sciences as Chinese or African medicine from Western medicine. One of the most important principles that the tree of life has provided to sages is the fact that the ability of an individual to be just depends on the faculties of analysis and synthesis as they have been explained in this book. On one hand, individuals cannot truly be held morally accountable for their deeds until they have evolved the fourth synthetical sphere within their spirit, as this is the seat for intuiting moral behavior. Now, the fifth sphere is the faculty through which man is able to intuitively understand and apply the correct application of the principles of justice. It is essentially based on the individual's capacity to separate his self from his person, thus making it possible to invoke upon his person the punishments, constraints, and regulations that he would place on others. It does not take much to see that all over the world, these are applied unequally. This inequality is the major cause of wars and conflicts in society. 
In a future chapter, when we deal with the astrological symbolisms of the tree, we will see and understand why the fifth sphere corresponds to the planet of violence and war, Mars. The fact that the greatest threat to the flourishment and survival of mankind is war is proof of the fact that this faculty is not awakened in the majority of people, including those in leading positions. The sixth sphere of the tree of life is the most important of all the spheres. It is the faculty where the equilibrium of man's being is established. All references to the golden mean, to being centered, or being in the world but not of it, refer to this sphere. When we consider the fact that the supreme being in its essential state has no other beings with which to interact, then we can understand why it must create the world, which is a diversification of its being. Life on earth, then, is a process in which unity governs the internal and higher levels of organization and diversity governs the external and lower levels of expression. When our consciousness is established in the sixth sphere, we are able to maintain the equilibrium between the forces that unite us internally to the world and each other and the forces that separate us externally. It also enables us to maintain the equilibrium between our higher true self and our lower personality that unevolved people mistake as their self. There are many factors in the world that demand this ability. Most people are caught in the quandary of knowing, on one hand, that all men are integral parts of one whole, yet on the other hand do not know how to acknowledge that oneness in action because of their need to defend themselves against others whose attitudes to life are in violation of the oneness of life. The sixth sphere intuits, teaches from within, man how to accomplish this task in all of its manifestations. As most men have not yet completed their evolution, there cannot be total expression of unity amongst them. It is important to realize that people are not going to manifest behavior without the necessary intuitive guidance from their spirit. The shaping forces of unity in man's spirit, spheres four and up, are still dormant. Their awakening and functioning are in mankind's evolutionary future. In the same manner, the way people live must reflect an equilibrium between their current level of growth and the spiritual goal they are seeking and are being pulled toward. More on this later. It's a question of genuinely acknowledging our limitations as a temporary point in our growth as opposed to a finite and essential quality of our spirit. Accepting our temporary limitations within the process of growing toward our divine essential nature will keep us from such pitiful acts like those made by many who felt that their innate divine nature would protect them while picking up rattlesnakes, etc. On the other hand, it will keep us from defining ourselves around our failures in life. The failure to understand this principle of equilibrium is the reason for the erroneous beliefs held by many Aryanized yogis to the effect that life on earth is without merit. Like the Western crass materialists who reject all that is not of the physical plane, many yogis have erred, but in the opposite direction. Since many problems in the world can be traced to the absence of this faculty, it is safe to conclude that most people in the world have not yet evolved it. The seventh sphere of the tree of life corresponds to the faculty of imagination. At last we are on familiar ground. Although it is not fully evolved, as we shall see, most people in the world have developed it to a high degree. The role played by the imagination in artistic creativity is well known, as well as its role in the coordination of details into a whole. While this latter function might seem to overlap with the synthetical function of the fourth sphere, we must take note of the fact that that while synthesis deals with abstractions, the seventh sphere deals with concrete thoughts. It is congregative rather than synthetical. Art, as well as scientific invention, over which it has dominion, involves the coordination and special arrangement of forms based on their external components, whereas synthesis uses a symbol, 
fire, for example, to bring together all specifics that share in its expansive, violent, centrifugal, and rising nature. The congregative thinking of the artistic faculty seeks to bring together fiery things with watery, with earthy, etc., into an aesthetic and harmonious arrangement. Put more familiarly, its function is to coordinate different forms, different tones and harmonies into musical compositions, different shapes and colors into paintings, etc. In other words, while synthesis groups together species that are different outwardly but similar inwardly, Congregative thinking assembles a whole by coordinating species that are outwardly and perhaps inwardly different. While synthesis classifies, thus giving order to thinking, congregative thinking builds wholes out of parts. The highest function of the imaginative faculty is to be seen in its not so well known control over our physiological and psychological processes. Western science has extensively documented the use of the imagination in the cure of diseases, the cultivation of behavior, and performance. Many athletes and artists have perfected their performances through imagery. Its power can be extended beyond our own persons to influence other people and to help shape events as well. But we must recall what was said in an earlier chapter. Such uses of the imagination are limited to coordinating the activities that have already been initiated in the third sphere of the tree of life, failing to understand that the imagination is a coordinator of subtle physical forces and not a creative faculty, despite its popular reputation as such. Many so-called experts in esoteric matters have erroneously recommended its use for the solution of all problems in life. We shall later see the great role it plays in life as part of the team of spheres that are in charge of the creative process. The eighth sphere of the tree of life is the exact opposite of the seventh. While the latter coordinates parts to build holes, the eighth sphere separates holes into their parts. To illustrate, the seventh sphere takes the different components of language nouns, verbs, adjectives, etc., and assembles them into meaningful units, sentences, paragraphs, stories. Oppositely, the eighth sphere will focus on each component, the nouns, the verbs, etc., in isolation from each other and the whole in order to study some aspect of them, definition, part of speech, etc. While the seventh sphere deals with how each component works with the others to create a workable and meaningful whole, the eighth sphere deals with the specific identifying characteristic of each member of a species. These two faculties make very important contributions to the nature of society. The seventh sphere is not only responsible for people's ability to work harmoniously, it recognizes the fact that the creation of complex wholes cannot be achieved without the element of differences between the parts. You can't have a painting with one type of shape and one color or a musical composition with one type of tone and one type of rhythm. In the same way, the world requires the vast diversity of ethnic and cultural elements in order to achieve prosperity. On the other hand, the eighth sphere focuses on the external and superficial differences between people, racial, ethnic, sex, age, etc., and things, and segregates them accordingly. Although there is a legitimate function for the segregative thinking of the eighth sphere, we will see that due to the lack of input into people's thinking from the higher faculties, spheres six to zero, the eighth sphere is the chief architect of man's social ills. The ninth sphere is the faculty that governs man's learning during the early part of life, as this sphere is part of the lower divisions of man's spirit. It corresponds to his spiritual infancy, and man's learning therefore comes from the outside, i.e. from other people and creatures. All acts of learning involve imitation and following, and given the immaturity of this level of being, such imitation is indiscriminate. This applies to all educational experiences, from the cradle to postgraduate, from the streets to the academic halls, secular or spiritual. It is indiscriminate imitation that makes professional scientists swear by the scientific facts of their days, 
that are later on proven to be no more than false theories. People's adherence to traditions and customs, whether these are secular, scientific, religious, cultural, etc., comes about in the same way. The danger inherent in this mode of learning is clear, yet it cannot be avoided. This fear is also the seed of memory, which is essential to learning. There are two very important facts concerning memory that must be understood. One is the fact that nothing that has been experienced is ever forgotten, no matter how out of view or difficult to recall it may be. The other is that many of our stored memories, especially those that are difficult to recall because of psychological suppression, exert powerful influences in shaping our beliefs and behavior. Given the fact that these types of memories, patterns for imitation, are stored in the infancy of our spirituality, they are illogical and irrational in their makeup. Contributing to this irrationality is the characteristic mode of functioning of this faculty. Not only does it store experiences, it associates them on the basis of external qualities. Unfortunately, external qualities which serve well for identity tagging purposes, naming, definitions, etc., do not contribute much to meaning. However, when we are trying to understand memory, the ninth sphere, throws up associated items linked through their external qualities. As a result, most people misunderstand more than they understand. We will later see the full implications of this concept when we deal with the fact that the majority of people who, due to the fact that the faculty of self-identity, the first sphere, is unevolved or dormant, assemble their self-identity out of the memories of experiences that are stored in the ninth sphere. It amounts to, I am these failures and successes as my memory informs me. The tenth sphere corresponds to two sets of principles in man, her sensory and physical bodies. The sensory body is the seat of our faculties of perception, sensual cravings and expression, sexual desire, appetite, seeing, hearing, emotions, etc. A study of human behavior based on the principles of spiritual science will reveal that there is a qualitative connection between the types of desires, types of emotions, and modes of perception dominating an individual's personality. These patterns of sensory mechanisms are integrated in the conception of temperamental classes. The various sets reflect the order established in the fourth sphere of the tree of life. Thus, humans are classified as fiery, watery, earthy, and airy. These are metaphors for the various types of human classes according to their metabolic differences. Fiery people are hot and dry, that is to say of a high catabolic activity which places their body heat in the higher ranges. This increases the rate of their physical and psychological activities. They are lively, impatient, easy to anger, zealous, prone to acute illnesses, etc. Watery people are just the opposite. They are cold and moist. We will detail this principle of temperamental classifications later on. The lower part of the tenth sphere corresponds to the physical body which is the vehicle that allows man, who, as we have seen, is a metaphysical being, to communicate with and act in the physical world. It is also the means through which the attainment of the illusion of being separate existences takes place. All things are differentiations and structuralizations of one infinite continuum of energy matter. While their essential unity is maintained in the higher metaphysical regions, their sense of separateness is affected through the physical state of energy matter. A Comparative Analysis of Man's Complementary Faculties In order to use the tree of life as a means of ordering our thinking and living, it is necessary to understand the complementary relationships between certain sets of spheres. We will recall that in chapter 6, the spheres of the tree were arranged in sets of complementary spheres, 0 and 10, 1 and 9, 2 and 8, 3 and 7, 4 and 6, and 5 by itself. A function of this a priori duality principle is that it holds the key to how people substitute the higher principles for the lower ones during the early part of their evolution. In place of 0 and 1, they identify with 10 and 9, etc., 
the best way to understand these principles is to view them within the perspective of the five principles governing man's life. Correlating to the tree, we get the following. The five principles governing man's life. One, peace. Spheres, zero and ten. Meaning, the ultimate why behind all actions, the emotional pleasure factor in life. Two, self. Spheres, one and nine. What man thinks he is. Three, will. Spheres, two and eight. What man thinks he can achieve. Four, power. Spheres, three and seven. How man achieves his goals. Spheres, four, six, and five. Principle laws, man's relationship to God and other men and the world. The why behind man's actions, zero, our essential nature versus the tenth sphere. In whatever way they have defined it, whether they have articulated their view of it or not, underlying all human endeavors is the quest for happiness. But what is it? While philosophers and psychologists have vexed themselves for ages seeking an answer, the tree of life, with its marvelous thought-ordering functions, guides us swiftly and easily to the answer. All things and events originate from the primordial energy matter, the subjective realm, which we know by now is a substance devoid of forms, structures, etc. This is due to the fact that its energy is in a state of perfect stability or serenity, Movement comes into being at the demand of time. Time is the ordered apportioning of things, their place for manifesting and expressing themselves, given the fact that no two things can occupy the same space at the same time. As matter in the subjective realm has not been structured into things, there is no need or justification for time. This state of serenity or peace is the master and primordial energetic configuration of our spirit. In the Kemetic tradition, it was called Hetep. What we want and need most is peace. To achieve it, we must return the focus of our conscious to the zero, the subjective realm. This condition is the highest goal of meditation. It is the state of Hetep, of the Kemetic tradition. Nirvana in the Hindu, Satori in the Zen Buddhist and so forth. It is not a serenity that depends on outward conditions such as the amount of money, weapons, the state of our love life, etc. Neither is it the fleeing from the cares and troubles of the world. Granted that returning consciousness to the subjective realm, its original level enables man to go through life with an unassailable and independent calmness. But along with this achievement, there is the knowledge that one has also contacted the root of all divine power. Implicit in people's quest for happiness is not only the urge for emotional gratification, there is also an urge for security. And there is nothing that can give one more security than the acquisition of divine power. But as shown earlier, the return of consciousness to zero is the last step in our evolution. We are born with only the ninth and tenth spheres active. That the tenth sphere is complementary to zero means that they are the ultimate motivators of our actions. As zero is dormant in the infancy of our spiritual evolution, there is no intuitive or instinctive influence urging the person to attain peace by the withdrawal of consciousness into the higher part of being. All urges in people's lives at this point in evolution originate from the 10th sphere, which we learned is the seed of desires, passions, emotions, etc. As this sphere is also our vehicle for communicating with the physical world, all emotions and desires are stimulated by information streaming in from the external world. Gratifying desires and emotional drives depend then on externals which are under very limited control of the individual at this point in this evolution. Happiness to people at this stage of growth then is the gratification of emotions and desires which are dependent on achieving or manipulating externals. Getting a job, having someone's love or acceptance, having wealth, fulfilling the necessities of life, indulging the cravings for food, sex, etc. 
All emotions and desires are in reality states of tension and disequilibrium of the energies of the spirit. All responses to our emotions and desires are attempts to resolve the tensions that they represent. Unevolved man strives to return these energies to their original state of balance and serenity by gratifying the external stimuli that activated them. One day, we will all, like sages have done, realize that the spirit's energies can only attain their equilibrium and serenity by being elevated to their original primordial level of being in the subjective realm. While the gratification of emotions and desires can bring only temporary joy, elevating our consciousness to the highest part of our being gives eternal peace. This is true happiness. The value of this reality can be appreciated when we recall to mind the individuals who, in spite of having acquired great wealth and fame, ended by destroying their lives either through an overt suicidal act or indirectly through living a very self-destructive life. The reason for this is that the tenth sphere is the animal division of man's spirit. It is called the kaibit in the Kemetic spiritual tradition, nefesh and nashash in the Canaanite Kabbalistical, umzimba in the Zulu, ojiji in the Yoruba, and Pranayama Kasha and Linga Sarira in the Hindu. It is the blind principle that tempted the woman, Aisha, who in turn tempted the man, Aish, and caused, according to the Hebraic tradition, the fall of man. It is unfortunate that so many Bible scholars have debated for centuries whether serpents at one time or another were able to speak to people. The fact is that in the Kemetic spiritual system, which is the source of most of the Hebraic tradition, the hieroglyphic symbol for this part of the spirit is a serpent, Apep, Nak, from whence Nachash, the serpent that spoke to the woman in the Garden of Eden. This part of the spirit is composed of subtle electromagnetic energies that have the function of animating man's life, especially the physical body. Hence the name animal spirit or anima and animus, as it was called in the Latin spiritual tradition. Our modern use of the term animal to denote the creatures that are thus identified is an example of muddled thinking. All things in this world are infused with this animating spirit. This agrees with the law of physics which states that all things are in a state of motion. The creatures that we call animals are simply those that allow the greatest expression to this universal principle. But it is of utmost importance to know that all things, minerals, vegetables, and humans are ensouled by this animal or animating spirit. To follow one's feelings and desires, to do it because you like it and so on, is to identify with the animal part of being. And as anyone would expect, to allow oneself to be led by an animal can only lead to disastrous results. One's emotions, cravings, and desires can never be guides to living and to what is correct. This explains the violence and irrationality that so controls the life of the majority of people in the world. The goal of spiritual culture is to lead man to the realization that the happiness resolution of spiritual tensions that he seeks through worldly achievements or direct sensual indulgence can only be satisfied by returning consciousness to the level of being that is the only and legitimate place of equipoise of the energies of his being. Life on earth is by necessity an unending ebb and flow of tension and relaxation. It is an expression of movement, rhythm, and music. But we cannot let the blind tensions be our guides. We can never abolish them, but we need not allow our consciousness, the essence of ourself, to dwell in their place of manifestation. It is to eat very low off the tree. Man's self-identity, the first sphere versus the ninth sphere, our self versus our person. We have already seen that man's identity belongs at the first sphere, 
when an individual says, I am so-and-so, this so-and-so must equate with the likeness of God, which according to the Old Testament, man has been made. As the sphere identifies with the unstructured primordial energy matter, which can thus become anything, so is man's potential of becoming unlimited. Yet, we must remember that the purpose of manifested life is to bring about a reality of unity in the midst of diversity. One essence appearing to be an infinitude of separate beings. Thus, man, like God and all of creation, is an individual. The term is made up of indivisible plus dual, therefore denoting a reality which contains elements that are separate yet cannot be separated. Thus properly understood, the term individual cannot be confined to denoting man, but must be applied to God and all things in as the world. These dual elements making up man's being are the results of the unifying action of zero and the first sphere, and the separating action of the tenth and ninth. In this book, we will establish the convention of equating the higher part of our being, our true identity with the term self, and the lower part of our being, where we establish a temporary identity reference point with the term person. We are born with only the ninth and tenth spheres in an awakened state. It will be a long time before we evolve to the point where the faculty of our first sphere will inform us intuitively of our true self. Thus, we begin life equating the information acquired through our ninth sphere with ourself. The ninth sphere, which is the seat of learning of the lower part of the spirit, learns from the tenth sphere only of our separateness from other beings. This is in direct opposition to what the first sphere intuits us. It also identifies with the specific pattern of emotional energy inclinations, fiery or earthy temperament, etc., that the animal spirit of each person accentuates. Thus, the person believes that he or she is a shy or brave person and so on. It also stores the memories of our experiences and through its associative but irrational function assembles a belief system of our capabilities and limitations. These three fundamental factors, our sense of separateness, identification with a limited expression of our emotional capability, i.e. with our temperament, and with the history of our accomplishments and failures are the major building elements of what most people falsely call their self. As this lower part of being is a legitimate point in our evolutionary process, it must have an appropriate label. This is the term person. It is derived from two Latin words, per, which means through, and sona, which means sound. It literally denotes something through which a sound is made. The understanding of this point is to be found in the science of mantras. Anyone who has worked extensively with mantras may have verified the fact that what we call personalities are effects of sound complexes. For example, the sound, mantra, cling taken into trance often and long enough will generate an artistic, peaceful, and amative personality in an individual of a different personality. The sound hurrying will transform a shy, yielding follower into a courageous and fearless leader. In future chapters, we will also see that these words of power are also the forces of nature that Westerners have translated as deities. Correlating this with the previous observation leads to the understanding of why in many African traditions many people claim to be the incarnation of a deity. We will later see that each of the spheres of the tree of life represents one of nine personalities, deities that man must learn to invoke at any given moment to meet the changing demands of life. In addition, they are each the steps of our evolutionary ladder. It is important to realize that man's placement of his identity in the ninth sphere, thus equating himself with a lower part of his being, 
is the second master cause of all mankind's problems. The first master cause is his being controlled by his animal spirit. The unity that must exist between people in order for there to be peace and prosperity for all can only come about by the leadership of the world resting in the hands of people who have evolved the first sphere, which is the natural faculty of unity. The will, the second sphere versus the eighth sphere. The will is the faculty through which we express our future undertakings and actions. What we will to achieve is ultimately determined by our self-identity. We saw that our true self-identity belongs at the first sphere and shares the same qualities of the Supreme Being. In reality, man's true self is one with God qualitatively. Similarly, man's will belongs to God. It shares thus in the omniscience of the will of God. The principle underlying determinant of success is not having a firm will or thinking positively, as mind experts will have us believe. It comes from man's ability to intuit God's will. The ability to do so resides in the second sphere of the tree of life. An individual who has evolved to this level of being is able to unite her personal will with that of God. In other words, the person seeks to be guided by God's will in all undertakings in life. Since all of the person's actions is guided by God, success is always the outcome. In addition, all actions are always in harmony with all other events in the world, given the fact that God's will is a reflection of its self-identity, which is the sphere of unity, sphere one. This is the opposite to the common experience in which people's actions and attempts to solve problems result in new and even worse problems. The Hydra serpent of Greek mythology that sprouted two heads for each one that was severed. But the faculty of the second sphere belongs to the higher division of man's spirit and therefore to the evolutionary future of the majority of people in the world. It has only been manifested by a few sages. When most people express their will to achieve a particular goal, lacking the input from the second sphere, they take their cue from the ninth and the eighth spheres. The ninth sphere, the seed of their personality, informs them basically that they are limited in their potential of being and separate from all other beings. The superficial and segregative thinking of the eighth sphere hides the connection between the things that people think about. This results in a limited view of what can be achieved and causes most undertakings to end in conflict with other events in the world. Meditation on the subject will reveal that most of what people achieve in the world is at the expense of something else in their life or that of others. This is the master source of all the personal and group conflicts in the world. In the same manner that the lower principle that unevolved man identifies with as his self-will, the ninth sphere, is not his true self, neither is the eighth sphere man's true will. What most people call their will are really their desires, hopes, and wishes masquerading as such. Man's power the third versus the seventh sphere. We learned earlier that when an individual develops the faculty of the third sphere, she has the ability to influence events in the environment through the use of words of power, i.e. the person shares in the omnipotence of the supreme being, although not in the same magnitude. The difference between this faculty and the seventh sphere, which is the faculty of the imagination, is that while the third sphere is able to create effects in the environment, even when the materials and circumstances to enable them do not yet exist or in opposition to it, the seventh sphere can only coordinate the shaping forces that already exist and are not in opposition to it. Unfortunately, the gurus of the achieve your goals through creative imaging school do not know this fact all that you have to do is imagine your goals see yourself the way you want to be doing the things you want to achieve etc and you will achieve your goal 
This process works only by reorganizing and coordinating the wayward shaping forces of a particular event. Man's knowledge of reality, the fourth sphere versus the eighth sphere. The next major determinant of the quality of man's life depends on what he believes is real. Whether they have articulated it or not, everyone operates from certain ideas regarding what is real and what isn't. The exposition of cosmology in this book has shown us that reality encompasses a range of states of energy matter, from the unformed, hence imperceptible, to the finite and restrictive physical matter that we are well acquainted with. And all things are none other than divisions within this infinite and eternal substance, hence essentially one in being. And that all beings are in reality the percolation of one original consciousness through each separate form in the world. Imagine sunlight flowing through glasses of different colors. The same colorless light will come out yellow through one, red through the other, and so on. In each case, it will have different qualities and limitations, yet they are all separate expressions of the same entity. In addition, it is important to realize that there is no separation, cannot be any separation between the whole light entering the glass and the light fragment of a particular color, wavelength, etc., leaving the glass on the other side. This is the message stripped of poetry of the tree of life. The message originates in the second sphere and is codified in the fourth. People who have evolved to the fourth sphere are able to intuit the cosmological principles that gave order to existence. They are thus able to create systems to integrate the lives of people with each other, the environment and God, religion, morality, etc., Systems or ways of life that integrate the various effectors of health, etc. This synthetical ability, we must remember, depends on the fourth sphere faculty's capacity to think abstractly. Unfortunately, this faculty is also in the evolutionary future of most people. Unevolved people are therefore forced to process their information about life through the surface thinking and external form limited faculty of the eighth sphere. They cannot therefore avoid segregating things that belong together. This faculty is the author of biases and segregation by race, religion, sex, age, etc. It separates medicine from nutritional science, religion from science, government from religion, etc. In addition, whereas the fourth sphere is informed from within and above, i.e. the divine omniscience, the eighth sphere is informed from the physical plane. It is limited then to one-tenth of the objective realm and is totally excluded from the subjective. Thus limited, the unevolved man, regardless of how well educated, whether in science, morality, health, religion, etc., is not truly able to apply the higher teachings efficiently in life. He can only see the external and lower side of religion. To him, it is a system of worship and adoration of God. Morality is limited to the specific acts that have been pointed out to be immoral or those acts that are not condemned by enough people in a society. So limited is his thinking to surface and external appearances that he cannot see that there is no biological or physiological or spiritual support for homosexual sex, for example. We can go on. Fundamentally related to the functions of the fourth sphere are those of the sixth, which is the seat of our ability to live according to the principles of cosmogony innate order residing in our spirit. This faculty, which is also in the evolutionary future of most people, enables people to intuitively and instinctively live according to divine laws as opposed to the tyrannical influence that the tenth sphere, seed of emotions, etc., exerts upon the ninth sphere, man's person. The same is true of the fifth sphere. It is the source of a judicial system based on the divine laws codified in the fourth sphere. Its acts of punishment are for the re-establishment of equilibrium in the world 
as opposed to the disorder spreading acts of revenge that the tenth sphere motivates. End of chapter 7. Please support this channel by clicking on the links below. Chapter 8. A Cosmological Guide to the Three Types of Men. Introduction. That there are in this world people of widely differing mental, moral, and spiritual abilities, we must all agree. We will see that the similarities and differences between people, when sorted, arrange themselves into three fundamental types of men. In the Taoist tradition of China, for example, we find that people are classified as the masses, superior men, and sages. The division of people into three types is based on the various stages in human evolution. In an earlier chapter, it was said that man's spirit is not a single body. It consists of seven divisions or levels, which include the physical body as its lowest and densest portion. A brief look at the subject from this perspective will reveal the following outline of the various types of people. 1. People who are controlled by their emotional and sensuous being, 10th sphere, and who only know what they are taught by others, spheres 7 through 9, and whose mental perception is limited to the external and concrete side of things. Because of this, their lives are full of contradictions, i.e. they are devoid of understanding. As this type of man has not risen above the fifth division of the spirit, the Sahu, counting from the bottom, we shall refer to him as Sahu man. Recall that the Sahu is the fifth division of the spirit. The masses or inferior men of Chinese Taoism correspond to this level. 2. People who are able to rise above the influence of their emotional and sensuous being. And although their knowledge is only limited to what they are taught, they are able to understand and think abstractly about the subjects that are taught to them. This is due to the fact that their mental faculties, spheres 4 through 6, are able to perceive the abstractions that underlie physical events. This enables them to avoid the contradictions or falsities that beset the previous type of man. As the soul qualities of this type of man originates in the Ab part of the spirit, we shall refer to him as the Ab man. They correspond to the superior men of Chinese Taoism. 3. People who are able to intuit the knowledge needed to avoid and solve all the problems that can face man. They also possess the ability to achieve such goals, influence physical events, by manipulating their spiritual power through the use of hikau and visualization. As this type of man has completed his or her evolution, we shall refer to him as an osaur. Each of these three types of people represents a stage in man's evolution. Let's take a more detailed look at the subject. The most important factor that determines a person's behavior is his level of consciousness. It will determine her level of perception, which in turn will determine what she knows or believes and her attitude toward her emotions and sensual appetites. When our consciousness is focused in the Sahu part of the spirit and below, the animal spirit, Kaibit, our mental perception is limited in the external side of things. We are able to recognize concrete specifics, but not the abstract principles from which they are generated. For example, the abstract perceptive ability of an Osar fully evolved person reveals that there is no such thing as a medicine or a poison. All substances can be used medicinally or toxically according to their dosage. There is a level above which arsenic will poison and below which it will heal. Although we all know this from our experiences with vaccines, very few people are able to arrive at the above conclusion regarding 
medicines, and poisons. The point to be emphasized here is that there are no concrete realities called medicines or poisons. There exist medicinal relations and toxic relations. But Sahu people are not able to properly understand such abstract entities, so they lower them to their level of perception. They cannot help but think in terms of this medicine and that poison, etc. The result is that they fail to avail themselves of the healing potential of the things in their environment that are intoxicating them, i.e., the very pesticide that added to the crops gives us cancer is the best remedy against the very cancer it causes. Hundreds of examples of this belief in the existence of non-existing realities can be given. It is one of the major causes of problems in the world. A very important question is raised by the foregoing. If Sahu man believes that there are such things as medicines and poisons, when they don't in fact exist, it cannot be said that he has knowledge. What he does have is the belief that the information that he has received is factual. When we fully examine this issue and see that this is the rule with Sahu Man, we will arrive at the conclusion that he is incapable of knowing. There is a general confusion of knowing with believing and acquiring knowledge versus acquiring information. Beliefs are what the Sahu Man has because the faculties of inner, abstract perception is dormant in the Sahu man. He is unable to into it, learn from within his spirit, the nature of things, and must therefore learn from outside of his being. All of his beliefs are shaped by what he has been taught by others, or what his senses report to him. He has no way of knowing whether what he has been informed about is true or false, as truth or falsehood can only be determined by the knowledge of the relation between parts with each other and the whole. As a result, he falls into a host of contradictions. When our consciousness is raised to the ab level of spirit, we are able to understand and significantly function with such relations as explained above. All of the contradictions and our vulnerability to falsehoods are thus avoided. At this level, however, we are still not able to intuit for ourselves these abstract relations, although we are able to fully understand them and live accordingly. The ability to intuit the abstract relation between things and the whole to which they belong is a function of the second division of the spirit, the ku. This mental function is the true constituent of wisdom and knowledge. These three levels of man's being are stages in his evolutionary growth. We must therefore look at it from this perspective. Stage 1 of Man's Evolution Sahu Man Although the Sahu is the fifth division of the spirit, we are here coining the label Sahu Man to refer to people whose behavior is dominated by the sixth division of the spirit, the Kaibit Sphere 10, and the fifth division, Sahu Spheres 7, 8, and 9. When we are born, our consciousness is focused in the sixth division of the spirit and the ninth sphere of the fifth division of the spirit. The sixth division, tenth sphere of the tree, is the animal part of the spirit, which is the source of the sensuous behavior that dominates the early part of man's life, first 28 years, and its entirety unless it is brought under control through spiritual practices, rites of passage, bar mitzvah, etc. The ninth sphere is the faculty that makes it possible for us to learn. As we know well, the early part of man's learning career is characterized by indiscriminate imitation. This influence comes from the ninth sphere. Rather than knowing, man at this level believes what is perceived through the senses and the ideas communicated from others. His thinking is limited to the concrete and external side of reality, 
as the faculties for perceiving the abstractions underlying physical realities are dormant at this stage. Examples of indiscriminate imitation are numerous. Anyone who exercises discrimination in adopting other people's practices would not wear high heel shoes, eat the host of refined foods, white sugar, white flour products, white rice, etc., or abuse alcohol, smoke tobacco, do drugs, etc. From the seventh year of life on, the faculties of the seventh and eighth spheres achieve their full state of awakening, although it will take another 21 years to develop them fully. If the person functions more out of the left hemisphere of the brain, the eighth sphere will dominate the mental character of the person. An inclination to the right hemisphere of the brain will result in the predominance of the seventh sphere. The eighth sphere corresponds to man's ability to give concrete verbal form to his feelings, beliefs, and knowledge. It is our faculty for separating things from each other and parts from the whole to which they belong through the act of defining, describing, and naming. We saw earlier how this faculty, due to its inability to perceive the abstract relations between things and parts and their whole, creates such false concrete categories as medicines and poisons. If studies were to be conducted on this premise, they will show that Western education is predominantly a process of providing definitions, descriptions, and names. This problem is aggravated by the fact that besides the creation of false distinctions, it thus deludes the person into believing in the existence of things that don't exist. E.g., once we understand the above, we will understand that poisons and medicines do not exist. We are forced to think rationally. This is the reason, for example, why Western societies, which function predominantly through the eighth sphere, the lower portion of the left side of the brain, cannot conceive of a female pope, a female rabbi, and are obsessed with segregation in all things. Not only are differences made between the sexes, races, and nationalities, but in the sciences as well. Until the 1950s, psychiatrists knew virtually nothing about the physiology and biochemistry of the brain. Physicians to this day know virtually nothing about nutrition and so on. They cannot help confusing the exclusiveness of the definitions of healing and nurturing with the actual healing and nurturing processes themselves, which are never nor cannot ever be separated from each other. The seventh sphere corresponds to man's ability to coordinate things based on their external forms. Colors, shapes, rhythms, people, etc. are arranged into aesthetic or functional wholes. This is our faculty for artistic and scientific invention. Although this faculty brings things together based on their differences and makes them work harmoniously together, like the eighth sphere, it is still limited to the perception of externals. As a result, the criteria for the value of its creations is based on their impact on the animal spirit, gratification of the senses. There is no real concern with the healing and consciousness altering functions of music and art, for example. As the animal spirit, the kaibit, is the first and oldest part of the spirit to be awakened, it dominates the sahu. In learning, the ninth sphere, the immature person inclines toward imitating those behaviors that cater to his sensuous and emotional being. The prowess of the eighth or seventh spheres is mostly used to rationalize or gratify the influences from the animal spirit, respectively. The behavior of man during the first stage of his development can be summed up as one in which he is dominated by, one, the urge to gratify the sensuous, emotions, appetites, desires, part of being. Two, the urge to use the mental faculties to rationalize the gratification of the sensuous expressions. Three, the inability to know, 
He can only be informed and can only believe what he is taught or what he can perceive through the senses. For his mental perceptions are limited to the concrete and external side of things. As the highest division of the spirit that this person attains to is the Sahu, we refer to him in this book as the Sahu Man. Stage 2 of Man's Evolution The Ab Man If the society in which the person lives knows how to spiritually develop its citizens, they will begin to develop the fourth division of their spirit, the Ab, by around the 28th year of life. Unfortunately, this is not the case with the majority of nations in the world. When our consciousness is raised to the Ab part of the spirit, a reversal in the relationship between our intellect and emotion take place. In opposition to Sahu man, in whom the intellect is subordinated to serve the sensuous part of being, with the Ab man, the self uses the intellect to subjugate the sensuous division of the spirit. The faculties of this part of the spirit, spheres 4, 5, and 6, we will remember, correspond to the celestial government. The fourth and fifth spheres possess the ability to perceive the abstract principles underlying and uniting things and events in the world. They thus enable the person to transcend the divisive emotions and mental functions of the lower parts of the spirit. The sixth sphere corresponds to man's personal will. Although a great deal has been written about the will, we will see that there are a lot of misunderstandings concerning it. The common beliefs held by Sahu men that the will is the power of choosing the course of one's destiny, that it is the expression of one's wishes or desires, etc., are full of flaws. Since most people's choices and wishes are primarily underlaid by their emotions and sensuous feelings, it cannot be argued that their will is at work in such instances. Essential to the definition of the will, therefore, is a choice of action that is on one hand free of emotional and sensuous motivations, and on the other based on knowledge or beliefs. The faculty that enables us such an expression resides in the sixth sphere of the tree. Although it does have the freedom to decide on a destiny course, this is not the major function of the personal will. It is the freedom to choose to live for the gratification of the lower divisions of the spirit, especially the sixth division, or according to the divine laws governing the higher, true part of one's being. When the person realizes that he or she does not have to obey the emotional nature and lives according to truth, then the will is being exercised. The true function of the will, then, is to deny the animal division of the spirit, source of our sensual and emotional expressions, its control over the life of the individual. Another important fact concerning the will is its dependence, not on power, but on abstract intellectual insight. In a previous chapter, we saw that the sixth sphere corresponds to the comedic deity Hiru whose actions are judged by the fourth sphere, Mat. This translates into the Western verbal mode of thinking by saying that the will, Hiru, depends primarily on mental synthesis, Mat. It is very interesting to note that the word Mat is kin to Ma, to see, hence insight. And it, the fourth sphere, is diagonally opposite the eighth which expresses thoughts in verbal form. In other words, at the eighth sphere, the self is informed by verbal thoughts, while at the fourth, it is informed by thoughts that are seen. To know a definition, eighth sphere function, is not to know the thing or event defined. It is hearsay when on one hand a dictionary gives us the definition, poison, Noun, a liquid, solid, or gaseous substance which has an inherent property that tends to destroy life or impair health. And on the other hand, our experience shows us that such substances as arsenic, 
The venoms of snakes, bees, spiders can be used either to destroy life or to cure illnesses in relationship to their dosage. In the future chapters on medication, we will focus at length on this delusive effect of verbal thoughts. While we can easily be deluded by definitions and names as their contents are heard and not seen, it is the opposite with visual thoughts. Unable to function through the fourth sphere, Western scholars have always believed that the visual thought hieroglyphic system of commit communicated mainly and only concrete thoughts. In an earlier chapter, I showed how the ancients used the image of fire as a synthetical symbol to serve as a common category for diverse things and events that share its centrifugal, rising, expansive, and exciting qualities. It becomes the common set for classifying and abstractly uniting courageous men, ferocious predators, the summer season, acute febrile diseases, hot and pungent plants, cayenne pepper, mustard, etc., knowledge of the characteristics of fire, or any one of the analogies will provide insight into the others. This is the essential means through which the cosmological or Kabbalistical system of correspondences yields to the cosmologician's insight into all things. All things are subsumed under one of four essential universal categories through the fourth sphere's ability to see analogies. Readers desiring to acquire a magnificent working knowledge of this sphere should study the Taoist and Five Elements principles of Chinese medicine. The synthetical or abstract unifying functions of comedic hieroglyphs is thoroughly shown in part three of this book in the section dealing with the Medjunetta Oracle, stage three of man's evolution, the Ba Man. Once the faculties of the Ab division of the spirit are perfected, the person is able to move on to raising her consciousness to the division of the spirit, wherein dwell man's God-like faculties. The third division of the spirit, the Shechem, enables the person to influence the course of physical events through the use of words of power, mantras, or hikau. These powers cannot be used as long as the person is under the control of emotions and appetites, as the words of power work through the latter. When consciousness rises to the Ku division of the spirit, the person acquires wisdom and the power to learn from within his spirit. Again, we arrive at a block upon which most men have stumbled. Their definition of wisdom as erudition, sagacity, discernment, insight, and so on is either false or tells us nothing about it. The well-read student of spiritual science would most likely be acquainted with the common description of meditation as a process of emptying the mind of thoughts. The reason for this is rooted in what was said of the faculties of the sahu and the animal division of the spirit. As long as there are thoughts embodying the definitions, hearsay, that we have been taught, supposedly telling us what things are and are not, man is a rational animal, he ascended from the apes, foods have nothing to do with healing, etc., we can never truly arrive at the knowledge of reality. All that we can ever know are the symbols, the verbal or visual thoughts that interpose themselves between us and the reality we are trying to know. There is a point of adeptship in meditation where we are able to elevate the focus of our consciousness above the sphere of thought manifestations. In the absence of thoughts, consciousness is able then to directly perceive the reality it is trying to know. At best, definitions and descriptions provide no more insight than that received by the three blind men who felt each a part of an elephant and concluded the first that it was a tree trunk, he felt a leg, the second that it was a wall, he felt a stomach, and the third that it was a snake, he felt the trunk. 
Knowledge then is achieved by the direct perception of reality. It is an act of understanding without the use of thoughts. The reader should take time out from time to time to engage in the practice of suppressing the process of thought formation. It will be discovered that thinking is a process of giving verbal form to a reality that is already known but lacks verbal form. Of course, you are well aware of the countless times in which you knew a fact, a person's name, an answer to a question, a telephone number, but couldn't reclothe it in verbal form. You know it, but are not informed at the time. These are extremely far-reaching points to be pursued in the chapters on meditation. The ability to suspend thinking enables the omniscience that man shares with God in truth, God's knowledge to manifest itself through the second sphere. When this knowledge embodies a directive for man's actions, then it becomes the true will that must be followed. The focusing of consciousness in the Ba, the highest division of the spirit, enables the person to realize that his self is one and the same as that dwelling in all things, as well as being one with God. One becomes, then, an Osar. We shall now turn our attention to how the three types of men, according to the faculties shaping their behavior, express themselves in the areas of self-knowledge, religion, government, economics, and education. Knowledge of self versus beliefs regarding self. One of the most important teachings to come out of commit is the man must place the utmost importance in the quest of knowing his self. The unsuspecting might believe that the acquiring of knowledge of self is a simple act of studying the appropriate literature. But we have already seen in the earlier part of this chapter that the Sahu man is incapable of acquiring knowledge, which depends on the second division of the spirit, which is awakened and developed in the Osar man. Unless we experience our true self, we can only believe what we are taught. We have already pointed out that although the spiritual traditions of most nations are in agreement that man is made in the likeness of God, i.e. that God and man share the same essential qualities of being, there is nothing in the experience of the person who has not evolved above the fourth sphere to give evidence to this fact. The evolved man directly experiences, knows his divinity in the same manner that we all experience arms, legs, etc. Intellection is neither required or useful. It is obvious then that we cannot teach self-knowledge in this or any other book. We can only provide information regarding it and the steps toward its realization. A classical technique for the direct experience of self has been preserved by the Tantric Buddhist of Tibet in the great Tar Lam Yoga, Path Without Form, or Mahamudra Yoga, the yoga of the simultaneously born great symbol, as it is known in India. The yogi assumes a cultivated posture that guarantees full relaxation and the unimpeded flow of energy. He then engages in a special form of deep diaphragmatic breathing, pot-shaped breathing which withdraws the focal point of consciousness from the senses and induces a state of trance characterized by a state in which the mental wakefulness is as much as 50 times the norm. Yet the person is asleep to the physical world or fully detached from it. In this state... The meditator assumes an attitude of complete indifference to the thoughts that enter and leave the sphere of awareness. There is no attempt to engage in thinking, organizing thoughts to a meaningful end, or following up thoughts and ideas that present themselves. This meditation process leads to several experiences. One, there is the clear experience that A, there is an entity that is conscious of the thoughts. Although this entity can perceive, it cannot be perceived. B. The thoughts come and go independent of the entity that is perceiving them. This fact, which we have all experienced, is magnified by our inability to suppress thoughts by merely willing it, 
or by those situations when we are trying to recall well-known things to memory and can't. C. The realization that the rate at which thoughts manifest, the manner in which they are organized, analytically, synthetically, etc., and the dependence of their contents, concrete or abstract thoughts, on the breathing, the spirit, leads to the knowledge that the thought activity is processed by the spirit, mind, and not by the will. Now, this entity that sees, hears, smells, tastes, and feels, yet cannot itself be perceived, is the self. And the goal of the yoga of the simultaneously born great symbol, the Mahamudra, is to clearly separate the seer from the objects of perception and the formative basis of objects of perception. The great problem in life the great impediment to self-knowledge is the general misperception that one is one's body, feelings, mind, etc. Once it is clear that thoughts rise into one sphere of awareness independent of oneself, it is then impossible to identify with the host of thoughts that profess to describe or define our being. I am shy, strong, sick, etc., and once it is clear that thoughts arise from our bodies, various divisions of our spirit, it becomes impossible to identify our spirit as our self. We realize that which is conscious cannot be perceived itself because it is immaterial, our self. These experiences have many implications for our day-to-day -day existence. When there is self-knowledge, there is the direct experience that the essence of one's being is unconditioned. Therefore, one's true self lacks predetermined automatic behavioral response patterns. There are no automatic thought and emotional reflexes to impel or compel us to act in predetermined ways because our consciousness is focused then in the subjective realm where the energy matter that is the basis of all creation is undifferentiated, infinite, and eternal. This is the foundation of the meaning of the statement that man is the likeness of God. When there is knowledge of self, there is also the direct experience that for one to incarnate to experience earthly life for its own sake or to enjoy and suffer for the sake of one's person in the end makes no sense, especially if life is limited to one lifespan. The evolved man ostensibly experiences that his spirit and physical body are not personal properties. Not only is man made in the likeness of God, but his life belongs to God. Man has been given the same qualities, same kind of powers, because it is God's intention and sole purpose in making man to use his spirit and body in order to enter and live in his creation. This is the true meaning of the glory being done on earth as it is done in heaven. These divine powers are not for the purpose of occult, psychic display, or for the magical accomplishment of our earthly desires, but for the furthering of God's divine plan. If our true self is the likeness of God, then what must we call that part of those parts of our being that in the early part of our evolution we identify with, but are not the likeness of God. The term person, coined for this purpose, which literally means through, per, and sound, implies that a part of our being serves to convey a sound, persona. This insight, which is totally alien to Westerners, would make full sense to a present-day Dravidian or to an ancient commission, as it is a common practice in their religion to teach people how to manifest any personality type through the use of words of power, metaphysical sound technology. Why would a word that is compounded of sound and through be used to indicate people's self-image? Skeptics must ponder this question, see if they can come up with an alternative answer. St. John's words are even more provocative. He states in the New Testament of the Christian Bible that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, 
and that the word became flesh and came to dwell among men. Putting aside the argument that this word is Jesus, we must ask why is he being equated with a word that is God and enters flesh? As for the word being Jesus, there is nothing that he has done that had not been done and taught by sages before and after him. In fact, others have done more and have given the world a better spiritual system. That is another story that we must leave alone, for there is no space nor interest here to go into the questions surrounding the veracity of his existence. The fact that many of the teachings, the Sermon on the Mount, for example, credited to him, are thousands of years older than he, and so forth. What is of greatest importance is the fact that in the midst of the attempts to render Jesus a unique individual, the one and only Son of God, the author slip and make Jesus state that all men will do greater things in reference to the miracles which were supposed to be the evidence of his divinity, thus revealing the divinity in all men, the third sphere of the tree of life in this case. John was not the only one or the first to equate the word with God, a fact that has gone without comment from biblical scholars. Faithful to the tantric tradition of the blacks of India in the translation of their sacred scriptures, Arthur Avalon in The Serpent Power states, Each man is Shiva, a deity, Osar, and can attain his power to the degree of his ability to consciously realize himself as such. For various purposes, the Devata deities are invoked. Mantra, a word of power, and Devata are one and the same. By practice, Yapa, with the mantra, the presence of the Devata is invoked. Yapa or repetition of the mantra is compared to the action of a man shaking a sleeper to wake him up. When a word of power is awakened and becomes functional in our psyche, we manifest the personality expression that belongs to that particular deity, mantra. Along with this personality traits, we gain possession of its talents and occult powers. We shall see in future chapters that each of the so-called human mental functions and talents are in reality the expression of the deities. Once this is understood, then it will be clear that the ancients and Africans do not anthropomorphize their gods. It is the other way around. That the gods resemble man is because man is made in the likeness of God and the host of metaphysical intelligences, gods, that it has created through which to make and administer the world. That we can take on any of the personality types through the manipulation of mantras, words of power, is the logical conclusion of the fact that we are made in the likeness of God. Our true self is no things, hence capable of assuming any personality, of knowing and accomplishing all things through time. It is of interest to note that while the common Western belief that each man has a personality, the comedic tradition states that each man has, in addition to his self, seven personalities. Kao, the plural of Ka, the comedic word for the person and personality, and must learn to give full expression to all of them, just not the natal personality that dominates the early part of our incarnation. Religion An analysis of the word religion shows that it is composed of the Latin prefix re, meaning again, back, plus ligare, meaning tie, bind, fasten. From the preceding, we have seen that the Sahu man, because he has not evolved above the seventh sphere, is incapable of intuiting the ties between things. Thus, he is the man that is in need of religious instruction to tie, bind, or fasten him back to something with which he had originally been one and belonged to by natural connectivity. The original oneness is implied by the prefix re, back again. It is important to note that the word yoga also bears a similar meaning to yoke, to unite, although it lacks the meaning component of the prefix for again. 
The things he has lost his oneness with are the supreme being, other men, other creatures, and all other things in as the world. It also signifies the inability to unite the will with the spirit at will. As he identifies with his physical body, e.g., when it dies, he thinks he has died, when it is sick, he thinks he is sick, etc., he believes that he has a separate existence and thus looks out for himself at the expense of the whole. Just the opposite is true for the Osaw man. As he has developed the first sphere of the tree of life, he does not need religious instruction, as it is the natural function of this faculty to intuit and establish unity amongst all things in the world. He is already tied, bound, fastened as a natural essence of his being. What is already tied cannot be, nor need be, retied. The term religion is also related to the Indo-European root, leg, meaning to collect, from which the Greek legine and the Latin legere, meaning logic and legal, law. The men who coined the word, therefore, had in mind that it is a system to collect or unite things that belong together by logic and natural law. Hence, it is scientific. Once more, it is clear that it is the Sahu man who is in need of instructions regarding the legitimate and logical ties between things. As the fourth sphere of the tree is the faculty wherein is understood the laws that govern and connect things and events, Ab men who have developed this faculty are truly able to practice religion. Unfortunately, this issue is not confined to the education of Sahu men in religious matters. As religion is a natural product and function of the higher faculties, zero to six, it can only be truly practiced by people who have brought forth these faculties. When it is taught to Sahu men, they cannot help but bring it down to their level of perception. If the first and fourth spheres within one are dominant, the most that one can achieve is the belief in the teachings regarding the oneness underlying all events as opposed to the actual knowledge of it. The experience and thus the capacity to live according to the shaping forces of unity is lacking. This is the reason for the fact that there are so many bigots, haters, and segregationalists in high religious places. They comprehend the doctrine of oneness but find it impossible to live it, earning thus the smear of hypocrisy. In reality, they are not. There is nothing inside of them that can respond to the religious values on their true level. The light shines in the darkness, which fails to comprehend it. When we consider the fact that the Sahu man is dominated by mental faculties that cannot perceive the unity between things, then it is easy to see how his attempt to practice religion is full of fatal contradictions. Despite religion's central theme of unity, we find him invoking God to aid him in vanquishing his enemies, claiming that God has given him the right to enslave the generations of Ham, black people, claiming that women cannot hold the highest religious offices, etc. The fact that Sahu man is unable to truly understand abstract categories shows up in his misunderstanding of the term God. To him, the term God represents a concrete entity, hence his use of the term as a proper noun. In the African tradition, the term is an abstract relational category, like the terms governor, president, etc. It denotes all that presides or has dominion over a sphere of activity. The African scholar, therefore, has no problem in understanding that a supreme God, presider, can create and administer the world through a number of agencies to whom have been delegated dominion or presidency or governorship or godship over specific spheres of activities. This is no different from the hierarchical administration of the physiological functions of our bodies or of the government of a nation, business, etc., once we understand the categorical, relational abstractness of the term God, then we are in a position to understand how man and God are of the same category of being, 
and that so-called polytheism is in reality a cistheism, that is, a whole supreme God compounded of several integral parts, gods, acting in concert with each other to fulfill the will of the whole. But the Sahu faculties, spheres 7 through 9, cannot perceive the connection between things and fails, thus to see the unity between the gods with each other and with the supreme God, as they close their minds at the outset to all teachings that expound the deities, they fail to avail themselves of the assistance that such knowledge can bring to them. Imagine a person who believes that all of his problems must be solved by the supreme leader, the president of the country. When Sahu man sees Osar men healing and affecting nature through the power of their spirit, third sphere, he then talks ignorantly, but fluently, of course, about miracles, the supernatural, spiritual gifts, only son of God, etc. If the etymological and semantical structure of the word religion shows that the term denotes a system for tying back, reuniting elements that lawfully belong together, then what can we say for Sahu Man's definition of the term? There is nothing in the semantical structure of the world that directly supports its being defined as an expression of the belief in and reverence for an eternal being that creates and controls the destiny of the world. It cannot be argued that this is a description of an important aspect of religious expression, but it is not the definition of the word itself. History has shown quite well that men have found it extremely easy to profess their faith in the existence and power of God, to feel a great reverence and devotion to God, while actively nurturing their sense of disunity from other men and other departments of nature. What would the course of history be had the world religions placed into the foreground the unifying yogic, yoking, at one mint principle that is essential to the definition of religion? Let's remember that this unity cannot be achieved by the intellectual assimilation of the appropriate literature, but by the spiritual practices that result in the raising of one's consciousness to the higher divisions of our spirit. Consequently, we must also change our outlook regarding the process of worshipping. While Sahu man's worship is an act of veneration, love, and admiration for the deity, the Ab and Ba men add to this the cultivation of the moral virtues and spiritual practices that culminate in the evolution of consciousness to the higher parts of the spirit wherein dwell the faculties that man shares in common with God. No one can be saved by living a sinful life, breaking the laws of nature, then begging God for forgiveness. Nothing short of living a God-like life will do. Regarding the scriptures, we are told that they were acquired through the divine inspiration of particular men. Once we have acquired true knowledge of self, we will know that all men are capable of intuiting divine wisdom through the agency of the second division of their spirit, the Ku, and the second sphere. Once they have awakened and developed this faculty. But Sahu Man lives with the impression that the reception of scriptural information is a phenomenon that is limited to a very few men of the past. Can anything be more absurd? Spiritual guidance is to be found outside of itself, he believes so he does not strive to contact the source of wisdom within himself. Imagine what the world would be like if most men during the past 6,000 years were striving to perfect themselves in order to manifest the wisdom and spiritual power that lies within them. It is interesting to note that the religion of African people from ancient Egypt to the present sub-Saharan cultures is characterized by the practice by priests and priestesses of going into trance to contact the source of wisdom to guide people and the source of spiritual power in order to assure success in the events of life. We shall have a great deal more to say about this later. A major theme that we find in some religions revolve around the issue of man's salvation from a power of evil. As such religions are essentially aimed at and are the products of Sahu man, 
both the power of evil that man must be saved from and God upon whom the salvation depends are conceived as being separate from man. In the African traditions, especially those of Kemet, in this Kush and Canaan, we find the teaching that man's failure to control the lower part of his being is the source of all of his problems. His salvation does not depend on claiming belief in a divinity, nor membership in a religious system, nor from the intervention of some entity outside of himself. It depends on his elevation and establishment of his consciousness in the higher part of his spirit, which is the likeness of the Supreme Being. Instead of a religion of an essentially sinful, ignorant, and impotent being who cannot transcend these character traits and must thus remain so and seek the assistance of a divine being, the African tradition encourages the individual to strive daily toward manifesting his higher nature. In the Sahu type religion, the man must succumb to sinful behavior with the hope that he will be somehow forgiven. His sins are excused as the work of something separate from and outside of his being, Satan. But research into the subject will reveal that the Satan of the Christian religion is a perversion of the comedic symbol Set that depicts the expression of the combined behavior of man's rational and artistic faculties in the service of his sensuous nature. The segregative way of thinking, the perception limited to externals, and the domination by the sensuous nature which characterize the behavior of Sahu man are the irreligious factors, verily, that man must be saved from. All moral decrees are aimed at them, and all fire and brimstone doomsday waiting in ambush of the wayward soul as taught by some religions find their rationale if not justification, in the fact that Sahuman only understands the language of the animal part of the spirit. Emotions, affection, kindness, fear, pain, etc., are ultimately the coercers and persuaders of his behavior. Once we understand the true nature of man's spirit, that it is made up of seven divisions, it will be plain to see that a true religion can only be a system that aims at raising man's focus of consciousness to the higher divisions of his spirit to allow him to function in a godlike manner. Not only are the religions aimed at Sahu man lacking in this perspective, they even lack words for the various parts of the spirit, let alone know that it is a composite entity that contains both the saving and damning parts of man's being. But things have gotten even worse. With each passing day, we find more and more Sahu people assuming the role of leadership in religious matters in the world. Economics. Economics deals with how people can best share the natural resources of the earth, the human resources, labors, skill for mobilizing the earthly resources and the rewards of their labor. It is important to note that the Sahu men, who are today in control of the economy of the world, classify it as a science, as opposed to a system of ethics. When Ab and Ba men are in control of the economy of a society, the sense of oneness, unity, between men and between man and nature are the dominant principles. All efforts are made to make sure that the wealth is distributed in proportion to people's efforts, skills, and social responsibility. It is not surprising that the Western world, which is built around Sahu principles, would invent an economic device that would enable wealth to be concentrated in the hands of certain individuals in total contravention to the ethics of fairness. This device is the prime use to which money has been put. Basically, it is created out of nothing, simply printed, made available to an elite circle, many of whom control its very creation, who in turn use it to acquire ownership over the lion's share of the natural resources, the means of production, and the vehicles of violence, in order to impose their will on others. That it is an extremely efficient and successful means of mobilizing human resources cannot be denied. But the absence of moral restraints, which gives the highest priorities to turning a profit, results in the fouling of the earth, the waste of precious natural resources, the waste of the world's genius and lives in the extravagant pursuit of trivia. 
75% plus of manufactured goods is not only unnecessary, it is waste of natural resources that will be sorely missed in decades to come. All those trivial plastic products, for example, divert materials from which drugs can be manufactured. All the human efforts expended in the mastery of manufacturing, marketing, etc. of these trivial things are at the expense of the time and energy needed for the moral and spiritual development of the citizens of the world. The result is that police states are becoming more and more necessary for the maintenance of order due to the moral vacuum that has been created. Government When consciousness rises to the ab or higher levels of the spirit... It understands that the purpose of government is to coordinate the various self-interests among the individuals making up a nation to promote the equilibrium between the needs of the individual and of the group. The only means of achieving these ends is religion. As the semantics of the term shows, its purpose is to reunite. It is the working of the segregative mental functions of the faculties of the Sahu and Kabit animal spirit that are responsible for the selfishness, segregativeness that characterizes the governmental systems of Sahu men. Their governmental systems are primarily means of securing and protecting the economic advantages and privileges of the elite. As this cannot be done in the presence of a true religion, then the latter must be banished from government. Law and order must come then from the use of force. Incidentally, this, like all fallacies, is a lost cause. There will never be enough money for the hiring of enough law enforcement people, many of whom are crooked themselves, and for the achievement of a significant level of social order. It cannot be policed nor forced into being. The shaping forces of law and order must emanate from within people's spirit. To separate government from religion is to betray not only the incapacity to govern, but the total ignorance of the meaning of the word and the subject. In the social correspondences of the tree of life system, the king is represented by the sixth sphere. It is located in the very center of the tree in order to carry out its coordinating function. In the comedic tradition, it is Heru, Shango in the Yoruba who must defeat Set, the creator of a governmental system in which the lower intellects, spheres 7 through 9, main function is to rationalize the sensual and emotional gratification of the animal spirit, sphere 10. Education The men who coined the term education to denote the process of training had in mind a procedure in which something is being led or drawn out, as the etymology of the word shows, from educere, e out, plus ducere, to lead, draw, bring. It is obvious that there is nothing in Sahu Men's common understanding of the term education that relates to the process it symbolizes. Western education does not draw out, but seeks to put something into the minds of people. In contrast, the comedic system of education focused on drawing out of the spirit its dormant talents and spiritual powers. Unlike Western education, which seeks to teach people to make better things, the African traditional educational system aims at making better people. This will explain the low interest, hence low output of technological wizardry of Africans. That they are fully capable of rising to the challenge is more than proven by the great contributions that they have made to civilization, especially in laying down its foundations. End of chapter 8. Please support this channel by clicking on the links below.